is too high, this weary soul, this vagabond. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting.
is acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh, praise the one who will reach for How can it be that there's a God who weeps, 
There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who will reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah to the son. God, we thank you for this time that we can come together and just worship and honor and glorify you, Lord. God, we thank you for the opportunity, and God, we thank you for the breath in our lungs, God, that we can just return that back to you. God, we pray over our service today. We pray over our time together, God. We pray that this would be an opportunity for lives to change, that this would be an opportunity for people to hear your word and to, and to have your word spoken over them, God, for the first time. God, that, that everything that we say and everything that we do, we just honor and glorify you this morning. Father, be with Dustin as he brings your word, and be with us as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can be seated. What's up? There you go. That's some energy. I like it. So this, that was some fun worship set this morning. I had a good time. I don't know about you guys, but that was good. Thank you guys for leading us. So if you're new here, my name's Dustin. I met some of you already, but I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad all the rest of you who are not new are here too. Um, so that's great. Uh, if you are new, there's a QR code right in front of you. Scan it. That'll send uh, you a Google form. You fill it out, and I'll shoot you a text from my personal cell phone. Um, we're not selling your stuff or, or whatever. So anyway, so uh, I think we're in, we're in this series on First Peter called Exiled, and this is week number three. But before we really get going, I, I, think, I, I think I need to deal with something, okay? Because I've had enough feedback from last week's sermon that there are many of you who do, new, do not know how to turn left on Highway 431, okay? <laughs> and some of you may have experienced some of these idiots before. Um, so... <laughs> rather than in the heat of the moment me having to roll my window down with you on highway 431 and tell you and you making all of our day worse we're going to go over it right now because obviously some of you haven't been to driving school like i have okay 
So here it is. We got it. All right? See the diagram? Take note. It's called head crossing. Right? I learned this term. Someone else texted me this week about head crossing. Head crossing. You go past them, and then you turn left. No tail crossing. Tail crossing is bad, because then no one can see. All right, we got it? All right. First Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, Peter's going to continue with this theme of suffering, this theme of exile, this theme of you, this is not your home, this is not your world, and because it's not your world, you're going to face difficulty, you're going to face bad days, bad weeks, bad months, bad years, sometimes, not all the time. You may face a bad de decade, but you and I are going to experience suf suffering. That's the given, right? We don't like to think of it as the given. We like to think, oh, I can be free from it. I don't have to experience it. It's nothing that we want to experience it. But the reality is, if you're a believer, if you are a person who is born again in Christ, um, is looking for heaven, another, your, your home, your hope, uh, the reality is you will experience suffering. And we might as well just go ahead and go, yeah, I got it, all right? And so last week, just review, Peter says, you should praise God in your suffering, bless God in your suffering, rejoice in your suffering, and he, and he gives us kind of this, let me show you the forest kind of idea, right? Or we could say 30,000 feet view, right? Looking down, here's the big picture. If you remember, he said, blessed be our Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who by his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So he's saying, look back and remember that moment in time where Christ saved you, where you became born again, where you were a new creation, and then look forward knowing, remember that your team wins, Right? You know the end of the score. And so you can face the difficulties of life, the difficulties of a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, and maybe even a bad year, maybe even a bad decade. You can face that knowing that in the end, Jesus wins, and ultimately you win. Right? And all of the bad things and the, and the suffering in your life will eventually come untrue is the way that we have, or the Christian hope that we have. And so we have that, that 30,000 30, foot view that we received last week. This is the big picture. And now the, the forest, so to say. And now Peter's going to say, let's look at a few trees. Because the reality is you and I can intellectually know these things. And we, and we can look back and remember what God has done. And we can look forward to what God is going to do. But there is this thing called the present where we suffer. And so Peter is going to give us some encouragement here in our, our moment of suffering. And it is the Christian approach to suffering. Oftentimes when we suffer, we ask the question, why, don't we? Why am I suffering? Or why is this happening? Well, there are some, good, there are some answers about suffering. We just don't like the answers. The Bible would teach that suffering happens because bad people make bad decisions, right? Murder. A bad guy chose to do a bad thing, and that causes suffering. That's a domino effect for a lot of other people. We experience suffering because we make bad choices. Sorry, but it's true. You and I choose to do selfish things, and that pays dividends of selfishness in our lives. So these are two reasons why bad things happen. And then the third, which is often the most difficult to swallow, is that we live in a bad environment. We live in a world that is subjected to futility, as Romans 8 would say, subjected to suffering. Right? We live in an environment that's broken that's not quite in balance, or as the Hebrew people would say, shalom, right? That's what we're pursuing, right? But we don't live in a world that that is actually possible on at this time, right? Think about it. Everything suffers. Even the grass suffers, right? The grass was rejoicing when it started raining yesterday, as was I, but it, it suffers. It starts turning brown, right? Insects, us, everything in, uh, with, that is living goes through this journey of suffering you see, so those are the answers for why, why suffering happens, but it didn't answer our question, did it? You know, kids, uh, my, my two youngers, so I pick them up from school. I don't pick them up every day. I do pick them up. I've been picking them up a lot lately, but as soon as they get in the vehicle, we're pulled out, and someone says, Pinguinos? Can we go to Pinguinos? And I will go, no. I know it's only $2 a cup, but no. But you can't go to Pinguinos every day. And I'll say, no, and they'll go, but I've got money. And they will continue. Well, mom lets us go to Pinguinos. It is Friday. It's Pinguinos Day. I'm like, it's Thursday. Right, you're going tomorrow. Not with me. 
But they keep asking the question because they don't get the answer they want. And eventually I end up giving in, right? Here's four quarters. You got a dollar, I got four quarters. Go get an ice cream or go get a pinguino's a snow cone. But oftentimes we do that with God in regards to suffering, and that's not a good place to be. It leads us into a dark place. We should understand that Christianity's approach to suffering is far different from all other religions of the world. It may be far different from how we would view it as, as just people. Suffering <coughs> isn't viewed as punishment, as something to be avoided, as something to even be embraced. It isn't viewed as something to be even ignored. It's not viewed as a counterbalance between yin and yang and a certain balance of society. No, suffering is viewed or should be under, understood as something that is necessary for the glory of God and the growth of his church and the growth of his people. Suffering ultimately according to Christianity and what Peter's going to tell us and what the, the entire Bible tells us, suffering is a tool that God uses to bring about his good purpose in us, growing us, but also to bring about glory to himself and glory to us. Some would say that suffering in Christianity, you think about this, suffering is the path to glory in Christianity. Think about our, the, create, the, the person that Christianity is yeah. for, Right? formed it, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. What is he known as? The son of suffering. A man who uh, is total, uh, a to in total um, opposition or in contradiction to maybe this idea of a leader who would dominate the world comes riding on a donkey, not an elephant or a stallion. He washes the feet of his disciples. He is a man of sorrow, boring grief, stricken by God, whipped and beaten, nailed to a cross. This is the path to glory in Christianity, suffering. So that's something we should understand. God uses suffering for purpose. So the question, become, should be at, the question we should be asking, uh, one, we should just acknowledge, I'm going to experience suffering and that's not a bad thing. I think you just said that out loud. Right? I'm going to experience it. And it's not going to kill me. It's not going to destroy me. It's not going to be the end of me. God will use it for good. God uses suffering for purpose. So now let's read and see how he uses that suffering for purpose in our life. All right, verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you rejoice. So he continues with it. Come on, Peter. Still telling me to rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Catch those three things. Trials are temporary. No matter if they last the rest of your life, they are still, from God's perspective, temporary in your world. There will be a day where there are no more trials, where there is no more su suffering. And uh, on occasion, it seems that they are necessary. They're necessary, they're temporary, and they're miscellaneous or various. Where they come in all forms, some in grief, some in health struggle, some in losing your job, some in a wayward child, some in just a good old-fashioned bad week where everything seems to tear up and you are meeting someone on Highway 431 and they don't turn left the right way. Miscellaneous or various trials. It, is, it, it seems to be, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And then look at verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter is pointing, pointing <coughs> in this moment for us to hold that hope that Jesus wins. And with that hope, we can see that our suffering is a tool in the hand of God. Though God may not have caused it, God may have allowed it. And God uses it for good purpose. His glory, but our refinement. Suffering refines our faith. So Peter uses that illustration there of gold, right? And you probably heard the old illustration. It's a great old illustration. It's not really how we refine gold anymore, but it is the illustration that gold to be, you know, wh where do you get gold from? Well, you dig it out of the ground, right? Find a vein of it on rock, chisel it out. And, you know, I, I saw one picture that was like um, 819 kilograms i think is what what it was it was a rock 19 kilograms that would yield like um 30 grams of gold and so it looks like this big chunk of gold and then they start smelting it and heating it in a crucible and then they do the process and you got 30 grams of gold i mean i would take 30 grams of gold don't get me wrong 
right? I think we all would. But the point is this, that we are in this process of refinement, as if you're in a furnace. It's this imagery of a furnace that Peter's giving us, right? So one commentator said, suffering is the crucible of our faith. So the, the old way would go, you know, they take these rocks and stuff and it's got everything mixed in and they throw it in a big pot, a vat or a crucible, and they would heat it. So they have to heat it up to nearly um, 2,000 degrees. At two th at a, right at 2,000 degrees, um, gold begins to change state from solid state to liquid state and all those other metals that are in there and the trash and the dirt. Um, it's called slag or dross, depending on what, what type of material it is, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that the gold gets heated up, and the other things get heated up in the furnace. And then the goldsmith starts combing through. With certain tools, he starts combing through and working that molten out until he's left with pure gold. And he works, it's called dross. He kind of cuts that dross out and scrapes it out. Uh, in this liquid form, it kind of floats to the top and just takes it off, dumps it out, and keeps working and he heating those metals until he gets to the point where you get what we would call 24 karat gold. Now, something I find interesting about that illustration and, and us is that, you know, that's how God uses suffering to refine us and refine our faith and develop our faith. But the interesting thing about that whole goldsmith and illustration is how does he know when he has the pure stuff? Right? How does he know when it's that 99% pure gold? Well, it's said, no, I don't know. I've never been to a goldsmith's shop. It's said that when the goldsmith can look into the gold and it becomes a mirror, it reflects the image of the goldsmith. He knows that he has achieved pure gold. The dross has been burned off, the slag removed. It's a great little metaphor, isn't it, that Peter gives us there in this idea and understanding of gold and its processing. Rejoice in your sufferings because God uses suffering to refine your faith and refine you. God uses suffering in our lives to burn off the dross of sin, of selfishness, but also of self-sufficiency. You know, there, there are some, can be some good metals in the dross. Silver separates from the gold. Self-sufficiency, we would look at and go, then that's a pretty good thing. But maybe it's just that the suffering in our lives, God uses it to burn off self-sufficiency. Because when we are self-sufficient, we may not look and hear from God like we should. He burns off that dross until the reflection of our life and faith is that of Christ. God uses suffering in that way in all of our lives. He can use every type, every miscellaneous, every amount of time of suffering whether it's long or short to refine us to be more like him that's where peter's going next week if you're reading ahead in chapter two but suffering also refocuses our attention so rejoice in your suffering because god uses suffering to refocus you make your <laughs> more attentive and it's very very true in, in a lot of things right we discipline our children that is um, calculated, that is purposeful pain that we introduce into their lives for what purpose? To refocus them most of the time, right? You have a heart attack or heart trouble. You go to the doctor, you got this going on. It refocuses your attention so that you start eating right or trying to or being more mindful of it and exercising correctly. A test, you fail a test. It says refocus. You have a wreck because you're texting and driving. You're less focused on your phone in the future, right? Suffering refocuses us. But I want you to notice what Peter's saying, 8 and 9. The next two verses. He takes a bit of a, a turn here. We got it there, Carly? Though you have not seen him, so it really turns to this encouragement. He says, God is refining you. He's refining your faith. And then he takes a moment just to encourage him and just say, hey, You've been doing the right things. You've been seeing the right things. You've been um, <coughs> focused on the right things. Look at it. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I believe it is an encouragement, but it's also an encouragement that involves an exhortation. Right? You know, like... 
we say, here, here's, a, here's a parenting tip, celebrate what you want repeated, right? Don't always jump on what you don't want repeated, but celebrate what you want repeated. So it's kind of that idea I feel like Peter's doing here. He's, he's celebrating what he wants repeated in these people's lives, that they would see even though they can't see or they've never seen. You and I have never seen Jesus, right? We've seen pictures of him. We may think we've seen some ideal of, ideal of him. He's not white. All right? He didn't have blue eyes. We know that. But that's a whole different story, right? But we, uh, we believe him. We love him. We seek him. We follow after him. We see images and reflections of him that not necessarily in his personhood, but in who he is, his character in our world. That's what he's saying to us, though you haven't seen him, like I saw him. Peter's writing. He saw him. He walked with him. I saw him, but you haven't, yet you are faithful, yet you love him, yet you believe him, yet you're, yet you're following him. Suffering refocuses our attention. It has this ability to help us see things that we couldn't previously see. We see a family dealing with grief probably because we are people who have experienced grief. We see kids struggling, maybe because we were a kid who struggled. We see people suffering in certain ways that other people may not notice because it's likely we experienced those types of suffering because we may have suffered already or maybe uh, have already walked through that pain. You see, the reality is God uses pain to help us see the unseen, the unseen in us, the unseen around us, and the unseen above us. You should write that one down. I'm proud of that one. God uses pain to help us see the unseen in us, the unseen around us, and the unseen above us. He focuses us in the right direction if we will surrender in that suffering to him. C.S. Lewis wrote The Problem of Pain. I love a good C.S. Lewis quote. This one's a good one. Pain insists on being attended to, doesn't it? God whispers to us in our pleasures. Yeah, he speaks in your pleasures. When your kids are doing great, he does. God speaks to us in our conscience, our consciences, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world to him. Now I want you to look at what Peter does for his readers here. God reveals himself in the midst of our pain and our difficulty, but also in the midst of pain and difficulty for other people. But look at what Peter does. As he moves from that encouragement of celebrating what he wants to preach, keep your eyes on Jesus, keep loving him, keep rejoicing, even though you're facing difficulty, for he uh, is illuminating things for you. He's refocusing you on him. You're going to know more of him, more of yourself, and more of the people around you. But look at how he goes, where he goes in verse 10. And I've struggled with this. I've had to really work through it because I didn't know exactly what he's doing. And I don't know that I still do, but here's what I think. He says this, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Can you see it? We, we, before we go on, did you see it? The sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Suffering and glory. Suffering and exaltation connected in Christianity. It is essential that these are connected. Reading on. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Okay, so if I'm just breaking this down, what Peter said, and I think, I, I think we need to do that because, again, struggling, struggling to work through it, I've had to just kind of do that for myself. Peter says there have been people for a long, long time that had prophesied that Jesus would come, and they longed to see that Jesus would come, and they, and they looked for that day over and over and over for the, rest of the, for the rest of their lives at that time, and they died without seeing it. Right, we can go to Hebrews 11 and see that. We can even see it in the Christmas story, right, with this guy Simeon, uh, these, these prophets, these people who are looking for the Messiah to come, and then finally baby Jesus comes. They're like the two people who get to see it, this guy and girl, or this man and woman, they get to see it there at the temple. But essentially, the whole Old Testament is a thousands of years of people going, 
He's coming. He's coming. We believe he's coming. So Peter goes, they didn't get to see it. And then he goes, but you did. Because someone from here came to you and shared it with you. Consider yourself quite privileged that you get this opportunity. For thousands of years, people who loved God, wanted Christ, longed for him, didn't get to have him or see him or hold him. But you have got to hear it. And you have, excuse me, have got the Holy Spirit that's transforming and changing you from the inside out. What an encouragement. But what's the point for us? Is that we should consider ourselves privileged? Maybe. But I think it reveals God's greater purpose. It makes this point that suffering reveals God's greater purpose for our lives and for our world. That God is, as we would say, painting on a canvas bigger than I can comprehend, right? I am merely a dot. You see, see those things where you look at the dot and then you back up, right? I'm mer merely a speck of paint on a giant canvas that God is painting. But I am a valuable, valuable speck of paint, and you are too. That God would use our suffering and our difficulty and our hard weeks and our hard days, one, to make us more like him, but two, to achieve something bigger than we can even comprehend we're achieving. Suffering reveals God's greater purpose. Your third blank. But here's the reality, I think. And I think Peter's giving us an insight here. I don't want to get back, so I'm staying with my notes here. Because um, the reality is, is that there will be some suffering that you and I experience. Well, let's say it this way. There will be some suffering that you and I experience that we know exactly what purpose it had in our life. We know it changed us. We know it, it made us more compassionate. We know it, made it, it gave us the ability to empathize with a child in, in, in difficulty or a family in difficulty. There are things that we know God used this suffering, maybe not even in our lives, but in the life of someone around us. But by and large, the suffering that is so difficult for us to swallow or comprehend or deal with is suffering that we never acquire closure for, isn't it? It's the untimely death. It's the loss of a job when it seems that we're doing everything we can do. When we're acting with integrity and then we lose our job. You see, this is the suffering that's the worst. Suffering without closure, without confirmation. It seems to be suffering without purpose. And I could just imagine those people for thousands of years, right? Say Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the one I think of off the top of my head, right? The book of Jeremiah, you find it in your Old Testament. Right, long book, rambling book. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. If you read the book, and it's hard, it's hard to read and comprehend and understand. If you read the book and comprehend it and understand it, what you will find is that Jeremiah does exactly what God tells him to do over and over and over again. He preaches, and his message is pretty hard. And the people that he's preaching to do not hear it. They don't respond to it. Jeremiah goes his entire life, and he never sees a person change other than himself. In fact, we have Jeremiah's journal in our Bible, too. It's called Lamentations, right? He spends his entire life preaching and failing and lamenting, crying to God and writing it down. But you and I can read it in the midst of our lamentations or lamenting, in the midst of our suffering and be encouraged. But Jeremiah also has prophecies about Jesus in his book. I know that I think there are at least 15 or 20. I looked that up, but I didn't write it down. Prophecies about Jesus being born, the branch of David, Jesus establishing a church that his gospel would go forth, that God would gain glory in all the nations and all the earth. All these prophecies that Jeremiah shared, he never got to see them. He never got closure before he died. And that's important for us to understand. What we can understand, though, if we look at Jeremiah's life, well, we know that God used him in a powerful way. And God achieved great purpose through Jeremiah's work and Jeremiah's suffering. Jeremiah's suffering did not destroy him. And God still used it with great purpose. You see, just because you and I don't see, feel, or experience closure in our suffering, it doesn't mean that our suffering is purposeless. Or that God isn't present in our suffering. 
Peter is saying that to us. All those people you hold as heroes in the Old Testament, they didn't get the closure that they were looking for. They died faithful, remaining faithful. I mean, God did good in his time through his people, through his son in his way. Now, if we apply that to our lives, here's what I would say very simply. Don't waste your suffering. Don't be afraid of it. And don't waste it worrying about what its purpose is, how God will use it. But spend your suffering burning the dross of self-sufficiency and sin. And let the gold of your faith reflect the image of Jesus to a world that's hurting. And it needs an answer for how they will face life in the midst of suffering. Would you pray with me? Father, may we be people who are faithful with our eyes focused and refocused and focused over and over and over on you, Jesus. Not down at our feet, feeling sorry for ourselves when we suffer. Not up at the heavens, shaking a fist in defiance. But may we be people focused on you, Jesus. That we may reflect your image to a world that needs you. And that your great purpose, your purpose beyond us, be evident, present, and true. In your name. Amen. I've debated on doing this portion, but I think I think I will. I made that decision at the first song, I guess, when Justin started playing. You know, the imagery that Peter gives us is that idea of furnace, right? So when you hear the idea of furnace, you probably think of a childhood church story, a flannel board story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Or Abednego. I know our kids have learned it. Kyle's been telling me it. You know that story about the big furnace, Kyle? Well, there's these three guys that they were exiles. Irony. But they had been pulled from their home in Jerusalem. It's found in Daniel chapter 3. They were exiled from their home, but they were kind of given some status because they were kind of the best of the best of the exiles. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, who's a bad king, he says... All right, these guys are going to, they're, they're important. I'm going to use them. I'm going to put them through a specific training program. But in the meantime, he builds this big golden off, uh, idol. Right? He says, when the music plays, everybody, exile or non-exile, Jew or non-Jew, uh, Babylonian or Syrian, I don't care who they are. I rule the world. And what I say is when the music plays, you bow down to the image that reflects me. And you worship me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the courage to say, no, nah. no, we have a God who's bigger than your golden image. We have a God that's bigger than the empire that has exiled my country. We have a God that's bigger than you. We ain't bowed down. Well, there's some people that look and see an opportunity to take these guys out because they're, well, they're kind of, they're important people. They go and tell King Nebuchadnezzar, they say, hey, you know, there's these three guys. They won't bow no matter what you say. So, he sets the trap. They play the music when Nebuchadnezzar is in sight of these guys. And these guys refuse to bow. Courage. Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, here's the punishment of fiery furnace. I'm going to incinerate you if you don't do what I say. So he takes those three guys, grabs them, he says, he's angry. He says, turn that furnace up. Seven times hotter, three times hotter, I can't remember. Hotter than it's ever been before. So much so that it's about to burn the place down. He takes those three guys and he throws them in the furnace. Let them die. Let them burn. And then Jesus shows up. It says that Nebuchadnezzar looks in. He doesn't hear the screams and the cries. And he looks in to the furnace. I can just imagine it being like up over, right? You're looking at this bath of just fire. It's got to be circular, right? I just see it that way. Looking down in that bath of fire. And he doesn't see three guys. He sees four. He says, what in the world's going on? They're not burned up? There are four guys and I just threw three in there? He 
says, call them out. They take them out. They don't even smell like smoke, according to the story, right? There's not a hair that's singed on their head, even though the people who threw them, throw them in there had been burned. Nebuchadnezzar goes, your God's the real God. Your God's the one God. Now, I truly believe that that was pre-incarnate Jesus walking with Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that furnace. But you can see the story and the imagery that Peter's drawing on. The reality is, is there's a furnace much hotter than the suffering that you're facing. A furnace that's eternal. Hell. But thanks be to God that you can be born again to a living hope. That the furnace that you may be facing, it may be a furnace that's going to go on for the rest of your life. Maybe you lost someone and you will grieve them the rest of your life. Grieve them. But know that that furnace, that furnace will lose its flame. And there is a God who's absorbed the wrath, the furnace of hell for you. And his name is Jesus, the son of suffering. That his suffering on the cross was not just human suffering, but it was the wrath of God poured out on man. That you might be counted as righteousness, though you're not. That's you today. Rejoice that there is no furnace that will burn you beyond repair. There is no furnace of hell for you. But if you're here today and you do not believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, that he came to pay the penalty for your sin, today you can believe it. Just saying, Jesus, I believe you died for me and I need you. I need you to save me. And in this moment, right here today, with that prayer, there is no furnace that will destroy you, but only a hope of knowing that Jesus wins and you do too. If that's you today and you need to be saved, would you please talk to me? But most importantly, deal with it right where you are. I mean, you can come up here. It's just steps. If you come up here, at least somebody pray with you. Maybe some of you are going through a hard time. You, you've got a furnace going on. Come up here and lay that furnace down. Maybe lay the struggle of wine I'm not getting the answer I want down. Have a brother and a sister come and pray with you. They might walk with you. You respond as the Lord leads you. Let's stand and sing. Sometimes marriages don't work. Sometimes babies die. Sometimes rehab turns to relapse And you live just asking why And after all the prayers I pray I still wonder if he's real And if he is, how is he choosing Who he does and doesn't hear I've tried to run from Jesus And started holy wars tried the patient waiting and the kicking down the doors i've cursed his name in anger with my fists raised to the sky and in return all he's ever been is kind tail and run I watch the wreckage in the rear view all the crooked things I've done and I know that he forgives me but it's hard to forgive myself I can't help but think amazing grace is for everybody else I've tried to run from Jesus I've started Try the patient waiting and the kicking down the doors. I've cursed his name in anger with my fists raised to the sky. And in return, all these. 
man's ever been in his kind And I know I wasn't there When I look up at the cross I see the darkest day be mindful um, for those that are praying and reflecting and I want to just say to you you don't have to grip that seat so tight that's you it's a safe place it's a loving place great church great people as they continue to pray well Justin you continue to lead us as you see fit bud and we'll just respond to the spirit sing that chorus one more time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm grateful for his kindness toward me, toward you. May we carry that kindness. May our image reflect the image of Christ to a world that needs it. Be mindful of those people that are hurting this week. Remind them, be reminded that you're there for purpose. And bring them back with you. Thank you guys for being here. I'm grateful that 
uh, we have these Sundays together. Let's pray.